The digital art era is here. AI and art creation tools empower anyone to make it. Blockchain technologies allow anyone to own it. VR, AR, and extended reality immerse us in it. Let's talk to artists and innovators behind the visual magic. I'm your host, Roger Dickerman. Welcome to the future of art. Today, we welcome Connor Grasso. Connor is a psycho-conceptualist artist. He explores the inner workings of the mind, conscious, and human experience. And he leverages a variety of inspirations, including his artistic lineage, his Alaskan origins, and psychedelics. In this interview, we catch Connor fresh off of his first solo exhibition. We dig into that, his process, stories from Alaska, and his wide range of work in the Web3 space with his own art, as well as with the Schiller team. Let's get to it. Connor Grasso, welcome to the future of art. Hello, hello. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure, man. This is the future of art lineage. It's starting to take shape. So an episode not too long ago was episode 11, I believe. Justin Wetch, who was actually one of two guests that day there with Dirk at work, Dirk Vandermeer. He sa I said, who should be on the future of art? And he said, it's got to be Connor. And here we are. Here we are. Shout out, Justin. <laughs> Let's go. Justin Wetch, the legend. But what, you know, I was aware of you, but it always gives me the opportunity to go deeper and to explore more. And, you know, typically, I mean, I'm sure it's the same for you around this space, the, the crypto or digital art space as a whole. A lot of times you see certain things and then life moves fast. <laughs> the space moves fast. And it's always nice to be able to sit with something and an entire body of work of yours for a, a little bit longer. And I'm excited to talk about it today. Yeah, man, this space does move so fast and uh, you meet so many people and you get inspired by so many different things. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be on the podcast here. And, um, you know, I've, I've only heard great things about, about you as well and, and your podcasting capabilities and things like that. So I'm, I'm super excited. No pressure, man. So it's time, time to live up to it. And, and we're going to do it yes. with the big, the big question right off the bat. The big question is this, Connor, what does art mean to you? That is the, that is the big question, isn't it? Huh? Um, you know, I think, I think for me, um, and just sort of my origins in, in art and, and I think what pushed me in, in the direction of, uh, of being a photographer and and just somebody who was you know very immersed in in nature and and being outside um I, I think ultimately it is just a for me art is just a reflection of of humans of uh what humans do and how humans feel things and um it's so it's so simple but it, it's so intricate at the same time and um, yeah, I think for me, I guess it's just the human experience and like everything that uh, is entailed in that and the happy and the sad and uh, blue and green and, and all of those things. This is a term you use to describe yourself, but what is a psycho-conceptualist artist? Yeah, that is something that I've uh, defined um, for myself over the uh, I would say past five years or so. Um, I think that, you know, a lot of my, a lot of my work was, you know, heavily inspired by psychedelics and um, reflections of psychedelic experiences um, and, and the concepts that are sort of intertwined in that and, and the concepts that you, uh, you know, you face and, and the questions that you ask in those experiences. Um, and I think my work is sort of constantly um, continuing that exploration um, in, into those, into those ideas. And, you know, so I think just, um, you know, a lot of conceptual work that's sort of uh, seeded by, um, you know, psychedelic experiences and, and, and reflecting on those things. Now you just got done with a solo show. I did just get done with a solo show. Yes, congratulations! Yeah. 
Yeah, thank you. My first one, um, I always wanted it to be in Alaska. That was really important to me. Um, I, I, I've done a fair amount of group shows in a variety of different places, but um, when it comes down to it, uh, Alaska is sort of like my artistic playground and uh, the people here understand uh the art on a deeper level uh because of the you know of course a lot of people up here like the environment here is important reason that they're all the way up here and um yeah i wanted to have it uh here in alaska and, and that happened shout out to uh jovelle and young from Aquila space in downtown anchorage also, shout out Alaska. I said this to you pre-recording, but I believe that Alaska is the first location to be doubled up on on the future of art. And that's, of course, Justin Wetch and now yourself. Who would have thought? Let's go Alaska. Yeah, shout out Alaska once again. Uh, you know, I, I love to see representation for, um, you know, just artists and people up here in general. Um, it's hard to make a uh, name for yourself being all the way in Alaska. That's definitely a, a challenge. So um, anybody who knows me knows that I'll talk about it forever. So. <laughs> so take a, because you're so, because it's so fresh, because you're just coming off your first solo show. Let's dig in a little bit. Can you give us, pull back the curtain, pull back the curtain of Oz. I mean, how did this thing come together and how do you prepare for it? And then how did you engage with it when it was going on? Yeah, I, I suppose it's probably, um, you know, been like many, many years of uh, just relationship building and, and getting to know people. I think, um, you know, our community in Alaska, especially for photographers, it's it's um, it's really cool. And when I first got into um, the kind of photography space, um, there was some. Um, uh, sort of like group activity things that would go on in Alaska where like uh, on Sundays, like people all the way, uh, you know, out in Seward would get together and go on a walk and take photos and go on a hike. And um, that's sort of how I uh, initially uh, met uh, Jovelle and, and Young and was sort of through those sort of larger Alaska community things that were going on at the time. Um, and, you know, five years later, I, I would say I finally felt like um, I had the work uh, that I wanted to display. And um, Young and Jovell had uh, opened up a gallery downtown years ago. And so, I, I mean, really goes back quite a while just to meeting them initially and um taking photos with them and being a part of the larger Alaskan photography community. So um, that definitely goes back pretty far. And so it, it was really just a matter of me being like, yo guys, what do you got going on the next few months? Um, what exhibits, what shows do you have? Um, I'd love to get something going. I feel like I've got um, a good body of work and um yeah, and when it comes to preparing for it, I kind of already had a good um, sense of what I wanted to show. Um, I wanted to, all of the work to be in Alaska, um, but ha also having, you know, individual projects that are obvious inside of that, uh, you know, sort of Alaskan narrative. Um, so it was, it was great. You know, I contacted... Um, you know, a printer down in Los Angeles and had uh, 23 pieces printed. Um, and, you know, always love to get prints of work, especially in the age that we're at now and the space that we're in specifically. Um, it's a lot of screen. It's a lot of digital. Um, and it's just a different feeling when you get a package of physical prints and you can hold it in your hand and, um also just the way that that connects with other people, people who aren't necessarily like directly in this space, people who are just coming downtown to check out the show and you can see how powerful, you know, a print is to, to them. So a uh, great reminder to try to print more work, try to do more physical stuff, try to pull it back into the physical world. Um, and uh 
Yeah, and the show was it was it was amazing, and uh, we had uh, Justin actually came by and uh, checked it out, and we chatted for a while, and that was nice. And um, yeah, good group of uh, Alaskan folks stopping by, checking stuff out. Um, not the normal uh, Alaskan photography that many people would expect to see. Um, so it was it was nice to see some surprise at the show. And um, yeah, I, I was just uh, very happy to just be there with, with the community and, and talking to people and, and answering questions and telling stories and things like that. I want to take a step back for a second. You mentioned coming to the understanding that you were ready for a show. How does that happen? Is that an aha moment? Is that a, a rolling uh, progression or a sense of realization over time? Um, I think it's a sense of realization over time. I think that uh, I definitely felt like some sort of level of like imposter syndrome coming up to things like that and feeling like, oh, I'm going to do like a... Uh, a show and and being like somewhat anxious and nervous for that but also you know identifying um just that i feel like i've created like a small little world and i feel like that's what a gallery kind of is is like a small little sphere of you know whatever you're trying to portray in your in your work and um i just never wanted to rush anything like that too you know i think um it's like right place, right time. Um, and uh, yeah, it was just, uh, it's something that I've always wanted to do again, of course. And and uh, I just, I wanted it to be, you know, at the right place. I wanted it to be in Alaska and I wanted to be able to, for somebody to walk in there and kind of like get a feeling. And uh, I felt like I was at that point, yeah. Talk about the work itself. You said it wasn't necessarily the work that Alaska was used to seeing. What do you mean by that? And I know we're on audio only and this is a podcast, but see see if you can convey that to the listener and myself. Yeah, I mean, um, the community up here and sort of like, I think what people outside would sort of immediately jump to, um, Alaskan photography is sort of defined by a lot of landscape or... Uh, uh, astrophotography work with the aurora borealis um or wildlife of course wildlife photography and um you know you can go around to the different galleries and shops and um things like that in in the city here and uh you see a lot of that work used in different formats on clothes and in print and calendars and things like that so I think that's Alaska's call sign, of course, is it's just like crazy wilderness, uh, crazy, uh, you know, natural geographies and, and animals everywhere. And uh, I think, uh, you know, I am deeply inspired by all of those things. And, and I love going out and doing all of those things and getting close to the animals and, and making those connections and it's definitely a narrative inside of my work. I think that a lot of people can identify. Um, I, I use a lot of very like um, desolate looking places in my work, places that look cold, places that um, look isolated, uh, which, you know, of course, Alaska is. And uh, but I wanted to marry that in my own way to my own style and to what inspires me and um sort of the early uh years and psychedelic experiences that I've had um which have stuck with me for a long time and I don't even necessarily like use psychedelics too much anymore I, I think it's the it's the early narratives that that I experienced that stuck with me that made me want to explore it more in the medium of artwork um and outside of substance um you know, use and things like that, uh, which is where I bring in a lot of like, um, you know, human figures and and trying to use light and cool ways to, you know, create an emotion and in, in a figure or in a space um, and kind of be like, whoa, you know, that doesn't seem right. Or like, that's 
how is this happening? And I think that's a lot of what happens, uh, you know, when when you are uh, using psychedelics is you might be looking at a tree, but it's like, what the hell is going on with that tree? Like, why is all the bark moving around it? And, and, uh, but yeah, anyways, I think that's, uh, that's kind of what I was aiming to do. And what I think I, I think I'm doing is trying to marry those two ideas together and, and, and show people in Alaska, I guess. What were the best couple thoughts, conversations, or outcomes to come from your time at the gallery itself? Um, well, I, my mom came and she brought me two huge, uh, bouquets of flowers. Um, and, uh, that was like super important to me. My mom's always been a super supportive uh, person, especially for me being an artist. And, um, she opened up the first, uh, film photography shop in Denali National Park area back in, it must have been like 99 or 2000. Um, and so I think like she's always wanted me to sort of like fulfill or continue that in our lineage and, and using the camera and things like that. And uh, yeah, just like first solo exhibition, mom came through, brought a bunch of flowers. That was really important to me. Um, just, you know, being able to watch my mom walk around the gallery and look at all the pieces and um, just be really excited and happy for me was a great feeling. Um, and then I, I would just say like the general experience of talking to somebody face to face moments after seeing your work for the first time, I think was also something that was uh, really cool as well. It's just like, actually being there when someone sees it for the first time and they're like look at their friend or they look at uh their family and they're like oh whoa, this is cool and just being in the back corner and being able to observe that was another great experience that that i think the gallery produced reflect on the the similarities and or the differences because now you've had a chance to do plenty of things in the digital realm right on on blockchain you've you've minted minted many things and you sold those things and then now you had an opportunity to have your first solo show and do that in person and sort of experience that similarities and differences between those two experiences birthing something on chain versus um having those in-person interactions and conversations around a gallery yeah i would say that um they're definitely really polarizing for sure. I would say that first. Um, I think that there is a level of um, authenticity and like uh, just natural connection with people when you're, you know, meeting them in real life and um, you're observing them and they're observing you and you're having a conversation. And um, I think sometimes like just you know, being on the internet in general, it doesn't really feel like that all so much. It doesn't feel as, uh, I don't think, gen- I don't, I wouldn't say genuine is the right word, but it's obviously much harder to communicate these things through a keyboard. And, and uh, I don't know, I, I really love both experiences. I mean, um, I would say, you know, the blockchain definitely, um, changed my life for sure and has been a a major pillar in in my career as an artist um but after my show i really felt the urge to really do more physical things and do more like um maybe activations isn't the right word but just getting like i want to make a book and i want to do a book now and i'm like my eyes are so much uh less set on on maybe minting my next piece and a little bit more focused on like five years of photos that could become a a physical copy or or you know doing a series of prints and like what do I do with the 22 prints that I have from the gallery and and things like that so I think like you know I'm definitely looking forward towards uh, doing 
you know, a lot more like IRL things and, and getting back to a little bit more of those traditional aspects. But again, like the, you know, uh, the, the blockchain is like so cool and has created so many opportunities for me, especially being like all the way in Alaska where it's even harder to meet anybody that's, uh, talking about blockchain and, you know, new technologies and, um, things like that is it's pretty scarce, you know? So, uh, I think that it's a connection for me to, uh, current culture and, and connection there. And, uh, yeah. It's so fun that you mentioned book. You are the episode after a photographer named Joey L, Joey Lawrence. And we spent yeah, an ample portion of his episode talking about his book, Ethiopia, which I had just gotten my hands on and was digesting. Oh, nice. And I've gone all the way down the rabbit hole of this eight pound, 800 pound of impact, the beast of a book. And so I don't know, I, I, I now I'm having fun sitting here listening to you talk about blockchain experience for a solo show but now projecting your own self five five years into the future and thinking about what a body of work that would produce itself in physical form would look like. Yeah, I think it's super easy to um, sort of, and, and I think that I've had a lot of great mentors over, over the years. Um, and I'm like super fortunate, like mentors that I never really thought that I would ever get to know and offered a lot of that perspective for me as a young artist and thinking not about like, you know, next week and think about like, what can I create over five years? Um, what can I do in five years? And, and um, yeah, I, I think about that a lot and you try to make the, you try to focus on day by day and, and then see what can you do day by day in five years and not day by day in one week. You know what I mean? So. I think that can, uh, yeah, shout out to all, all the mentors that I've had too. And also Joey is just incredible. I have to say it. Joey's uh, a beast of a photographer and, and some somebody that I definitely look up to. And his imagery is just like crazy. I don't really, <laughs> you could dive into it and say a lot better words and make a better analysis than crazy. But um, they it, those images definitely stop you in your tracks and like, make you think for a second that's for, for sure. sure for sure and, and uh co-sign on that one to joey big big shout out and a lot of love to joey l and then something that you said and i can't remember the attribution so apologies to the classical person who said this but something along the lines of you can accomplish less than you think you can in a year but far more than you think you can in, in five or ten years and so again it's just it's fun it's fun to hear you thinking that way and and to me it causes me to reflect on the state of the space talking about the crypto art space and thinking about how it really took off at the tail end of 2020 into early 2021 and I think a lot of folks have been in sprint mode for a couple of years. And I I see the signs on the wall now, like a lot of people are slowing down and looking around and doing more things in physical spaces and thinking in longer timelines and timeframes. And I think that in the end, that's very, very healthy. Yeah, I think it's healthy too. I, I'm, I, I also noticed that. I noticed a lot of people are slowing down and, and you know, putting out you know, more in-depth projects or talking about the projects that they're working on in a longer format. Um, and it's definitely noticeable. And there also, when things were peaking, there was also like notoriety of like rushing. And I definitely did a bit of that myself. It's hard not to. Um, and I kind of like where it's coming down into as well. I think it feels like more stable like, I think it feels a little bit more comfy, a little bit more stable. And, you know, you, I think it's important to focus on the benefits of those aspects and not so much about like numbers and like the rush to do this or to do that or, um, so yeah, I think it's pretty cool. I'm, I'm excited for the next like five, 10 years on, on chain. Where will you go? So you've mentioned book. You mentioned wanting yes. to pursue, you use the word activation. I know you pivoted a little off that word, but we get it. Like I get, I get where yeah. your mind is at. What else? Yeah. What else is the future hold in store for you? 
Um, I don't know. I don't know. I'm uh I'm just like we're getting into winter time here, uh, which I love the winter time and well I love the winter time for uh like the visual aspects. It gets a little cold. I mean I'm I'm originally from even even farther north in Alaska where it gets like negative 30, negative 40 in the winter times. And uh, there's a beauty in that too. And being like far in the Arctic and now I'm living in Southern Alaska, which is much more like doable. You know, you get like 20 degrees. That's cool. Like not too crazy. <laughs> um, I always sound crazy when I say that to people that don't live in Alaska, but there's plenty of other places where it gets that cold and even colder. I'm I'm a little um, I'm a little more desensitized to it now because I talk to Justin all the time with artifacts, right? So, but we yeah. will have these conversations where he's like, "Oh, it's really it's beautiful today. It's super warm." I'm like, "How how warm is it? It's 58 degrees." I'm like, "Justin, yeah. it's 93 degrees over here." <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, I don't I don't know what's next for me. I'm really excited about this winter and um, getting outside and. And I've really just been the last three months, I've been really focusing on my physical health, um, something that I haven't done so much. And uh, probably since I played sports in school. Um, so I've really uh, have been more active uh, and focused on on my physical health and mental health, for sure, in the last three months, more than, you know, the last five years. Um, so I've really been focusing on that. So that's what's next for me is really just focusing on 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 my health and um gearing up for the winter time um excited for the aurora to come back um excited to get out to some cool places in the winter um and uh of course i'll be uh doing a little bit of traveling thing and things like that um i'll be down in Miami in November. I'll be I'll be in LA. I'll be in Miami. I'll be in I'll be in New York doing other things and working on some other projects that I've got going on outside of NFTs. Um, and uh, yeah, that's kind of next. Just taking it slow right now and, and focusing on um, what I feel is the most important in the moment. It's a good thing. So you talked about the Aurora coming back. I want to dig into creative inspirations from a couple of different angles. And the first place I'll go is Alaska because you mentioned the Aurora coming back. And so my question is twofold. One, when does it come back? And then two, how do you think about that? How do you prepare for it? Uh, you know, you want to get out there and capture it in some way, shape or form. How does that come together? Yeah. So the way that um, the Aurora kind of works is um I suppose it's not that it necessarily comes back, but it becomes visible again um, in Alaska and and far up here in the north, um, in in you know of course in places like Sweden and Norway and things like that. We obviously get an abundance of light in the summertime, um, so it doesn't really get dark enough so where that you could see these particles interacting with our atmosphere. So it's more of a matter of like, it's going on right now, but we just can't see it basically. Um, and then when it starts to get dark around this time, the Aurora is starting to pop out a little bit and, and about nine o'clock it starts to get dark again. And we just got done with, you know, two, three months of pretty much daylight, um, you know, all summer. Um, so yeah and and of course in in the winter time we experience like a very long period of darkness um and it's kind of the only little bit of light you get to see in the sky for quite a while besides a few hours of sunlight um and uh so yeah that's kind of like the way that it works it's more about visibility rather than it coming back and and of course in the winter time when it's dark all the way up here you see it a lot um and yeah, and you also asked about the process of going out and doing that. Um, I've been taking photos of the, of the Aurora for probably seven or eight years now, um, which would put it at like maybe I started around 17, 16 or 17. I'm 24 now. So um, it's been quite a while. And the process has always been like spur of the moment, mostly. And um I do check the uh, uh, 
the university up in Fairbanks, they have a, a Aurora analysis report that they put out. Um, and that'll show you like the KP index. And you can kind of gauge based on that data, whether it's going to be like a night, like okay, let's uh, get a group of friends together or go by myself. Um, <clears throat> it's a lot of warm gear. It's a lot of uh, uh, driving down the road in the cold and the dark, like looking up at the sky, trying to see like where we're going to go. And I love the freedom of, of going out and shooting the Aurora because it's a chase. It's really, there's a term called Aurora chasing it. And it really is that chase and being like, okay, which direction am I seeing it in the sky real time? Like, can I go that way? Can I get there? Do I need to find an angle to where that I can, you know, try to photograph it from a different perspective. And um, I have to say that uh, for so many years, it was like in high school, rather than I, I was totally going out and shooting <laughs> the Aurora by myself on like a Friday night and a Saturday night. And, um, that was like totally my thing. And, uh, a lot of just, uh, beautiful moments out doing that kind of stuff. And the, when, when it's really cold up here and it's really dark and you're out in a place where there's no people, which is really easy to do here. It only is like a five minute drive. <laughs> and there's like, no, you will not see anybody. Um, it, 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 automatically puts you in this sort of reflective uh mindset i mean you're out here it's very isolating it's very dark and it's so cold that uh sound waves just seem like they can like travel forever you could hear a car on the highway like so far away and you could be all the way like on a mountain over here like waist deep in snow and um, there's just like this frigidness in the air and it's really magical. And I think you're just kind of sitting there. And when you're shooting the Aurora, you're just sitting there and you're waiting and you're thinking about the composition. And sometimes you get an insane show and you can just snap away and snap away. And sometimes you sit there for seven hours uh, waiting to get one shot and it never comes. And I think that that's a beautiful thing to... Um, as an artist to do is, you know, I'm like going to go out here and do this. And sometimes it doesn't happen. And I, I actually really appreciate those moments just as much as I appreciate the ones when you get some of the craziest photos and the auroras dancing through the sky. Seven or eight years of Aurora chasing, give us your highest of highs and your lowest of lows. I mean, the highest of highs being something that surprised you, shocked you that you just got maybe the killer shot and it was exactly the right moment. And then, of course, the reverse of that, where maybe you thought something was going to happen and, and you were just crushed. Yeah, um, there has been many of times of Aurora chasing and uh, no success. There's been a lot of like, let's drive three hours this way um, and make a big plan and go do this. And it's just like a layer of clouds flies in and it's there all night and you're have you're so committed it's definitely a lot of uh you really take your l on the commitment side for that because you're all geared up it's like super late uh you're going out to a spot you've got a crew together you've got to hike up once you drive all the way there you've got to hike all the way up in snowshoes to this uh point of view and um so that's definitely i haven't had any like tragic camera accidents or anything like that fortunately um but the the wins are the the one win is worth like 10 l's and that's usually how it goes uh you know it's you you know you're not like finding that success every time in alaska and the weather that we have here and how variable it is and how you could drive one hour one way and the weather is a completely different system and um, I've had some really, I have a edition that, um, I released a while back called Alaska. And that was one of my favorite moments of Aurora chasing and, and definitely the last seven or eight years. Um, that was just, uh, that was one of those nights where it was really clear and we got a group of friends together and we all geared up and, we, we drove out to this place called uh, Angel Rocks, which is 
I think roughly 45 minutes or an hour north of, of Fairbanks, Alaska. And we, uh, <laughs> we didn't bring any like snowshoes or anything. So we're like, uh, knee deep trudging through like very hard, like, uh, you know, brick like snow and we're hiking and hiking and hiking. And, uh, we get up to the, to one of the really large boulders and, and we stop for a second and it's not looking promising for us. And we're all like, man, it's like, we can see the entire horizon line and there's nothing going on. And in literal seconds, the entire sky turned from black with stars to an absolute explosion of aurora and it's it's like you look we were looking at the sky when we looked away for a second to say something and then you looked back up and the aurora was just dancing and green and red and yellow all through the sky just going so fast and um i kind of uh immediately like the challenge is not watching it for too long and remembering to take a photo. I find that to be a challenge and you get so lost in it and the experience. And there's even plenty of times where I've gone out on these sort of expeditions to do this. And I've decided not to take photos. Like now's the time to just sit here and, and fully take it in and, and, and really feel the experience. And, um, I just caught a photo of my friend sort of reacting to that explosion uh, in the sky of of the aurora, and that was I have very fond memories from from that trip and and that shoot and especially that image. Creative inspiration part two. I want to double back to your mom because that one caught me. And um, you mentioned that that she had opened something up very special. I believe right around when you were born, right? Yes. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. She. Um, she started a little photography business out there. Um, this was like still pretty early on in terms of like the tourist, uh, um, like tourist traffic up to Denali. Um, and, you know, it was kind of before everything really ramped up there. And um, yeah, she just kind of opened up this little business and, and um, yeah, she would take, pictures for people that uh would come to alaska and take them to cool local places and uh yeah she did a variety of different uh, different things and uh she's also always been super supportive of um artists she's a, a kindergarten and first grade teacher and she's taught many of grades and um she's won awards and uh been teacher of the year in a variety of different places and i think uh yeah she's just a great person and a great person especially to be working with those kids and and uh telling them they can do whatever they want to do in their life and um yeah uh just like growing up with my mom and and um i don't know if you've ever seen the film into the wild uh but i grew up on that road uh from that film and uh I lived in a dry cabin and I didn't uh, have any running water till I was probably what seven, maybe. Um, so we lived a very like rural Alaskan lifestyle. And, and um, my mom was a important influence in that kind of lifestyle and us always being outside and making little art projects and, um, you know, living off the land and um, just constantly being out there, you know, and I think like, with those two things sort of marrying themselves together and and being outdoors and living like that and also having uh, an immense amount of support to just be yourself and be creative was, um, you know, I'm very lucky and fortunate to have had that experience growing up. I was going to ask you that. I was going to ask you your your takeaway from that because my my natural reaction is to impose a sense of romanticism to that. But that's that's where I sit, right? Not not having experienced that. And I mentioned another thing up to you off off air, but had a chance to to interact with with two kids from Alaska and and, and learn a lot from them as as part of um kind of like this foundation thing. But I learned a lot about their their challenges in the wilderness and and different things that they had to go through from even like just a straight testing perspective. Um, so I want to say it's romantic, but I imagine there had to be challenges as well. Um, how would you interpret it at all? 
Um, yeah, that's a great way to put it. Um, there it's, a you know, it's definitely a harder lifestyle. Um, but there's beauty in that. And there's also uh simplicity in that. Um, when I was growing up, I was so disconnected from like everything that was going on in the world, uh, outside of like Alaska. And, um, there's benefits to that. And, uh, you know, there's negatives that to that as well, but, um, yeah, I think, uh, I guess what, what was your question again? No, I just, I, I'm so inclined to view it through that magical or romantic oh, lens. Oh, right, so right, right, I, right, I want, right, right, yeah. I wanted to balance yeah, it with then, your actual so, experience. I mean, I mean, okay, so I'll, I'll try to put it into a sort of like a, a visual, like a mental visual. So, you know, of course we're running around as kids and by the time, you know, you're 10 or 11, you're like riding a four wheeler with a gun slung over your shoulder with your friends and you're jumping in lakes and, and, um, but also the nearest grocery store is two hours away. So you're, it's January, February, it's negative 30 degrees and you live in a cabin without running water. Um, and you've got to drive two hours uh, in the middle of the winter, pitch black down a highway with your whole family uh, to go get groceries, you know? So there, there's a like, you know, and there's, you know, people who are even further away from access to those kinds of things. So access to a lot of the things that I think we take for granted um, is, is huge in that lifestyle. And it's also, you know, the simplicity of my childhood was like, I think about that all the time. Like it was just uh very natural and very like connected to, to the earth and connected to the environment and respecting and learning about all of those things and needing to do that. I think that's another thing is like uh, maybe the kids that you worked with, you know, that they've already had like wilderness survival trainings and, uh, gun handling trainings and they have like sort of the um uh, they, it's almost like you grow up like faster here but i wouldn't necessarily say that like you are uh you know more inclined to like pull your weight around and um you know i i live in the city now but when i was growing up it was definitely like we got, we got to get stuff done and like the winter's coming and you've got to, you know, go hunting and you've got to go fishing and you've got to do these things to store up the freezer. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of challenges to that, you know, and, and another big one that I want to shine light on is like, uh, you know, seasonal depression and things like that in Alaska is very tough. Um, in the winter time when we don't have sunlight and it's super cold, um, a lot of people struggle with that. And, um, that's a huge, it's, uh, you know, there's plenty of statistics and things like that, but that's another thing that being up here is a struggle with. It's like, you don't get sunlight for <laughs> four, four months or whatever it is. And, uh, yeah, but it's, it's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful, but challenging. And, and I think it's a really valuable, uh, lifestyle to, to be up here. I think it's very worth it. The summers make every moment of it all worth it <laughs> i imagine that's the other side to seasonal to seasonal depression and 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 that very real aspect is when when it does break right when it does break and the sunlight starts flooding in i imagine that has to be glorious yeah you can feel it in your body like you can actually feel it coursing through your body after the winter when the long days start like it's like you can feel it tingling through your whole body when the sun hits your face and you actually feel the warmth of it for the first time in four months. Like, it's just cool, you know, because like all the animals are doing that. Like you look at all the birds and now all the birds are zipping around, flying around. And like you've got all these little animals that are excited and to come out and play for the summer. And you know what I mean? All the fish start flying in all the rivers and it just makes you relate yourself. I think, you know, it's just a reminder that we're also animals too in those moments and that's another powerful thing about alaska as well is it's hard not to feel like um 
just even addressing like an animal like uh oh there's a bear over there it's kind of like hey what's that guy doing and you kind of you kind of uh remove that aspect of like we're so different it's like uh you know when you see a when you're hiking down a trail and you see like a dog and you're like who's this guy what's up buddy and you and you communicate to the animals like that and uh yeah it's a beautiful thing i told you i'll talk about this all day i, I told you i told you i'll go all day i think it's so <laughs> powerful I, I, just having a diverse set of conversations something i'm constantly thinking about is what inspires us all you know what what really taps us into what we're focused on and what we're doing and obviously this space revolves around a lot of art and a lot of creativity and so that becomes even more under a magnifying glass but I think about it in terms of environment. I think about it in terms of origin story and history. And then the, uh, another place I want to go um, outside of your mom, but just just people, right? And and the people that we spend the most time with, the people that we look to as shining examples of, uh, you know, what what they're doing and and how it reflects on what we're doing. Uh, I'm going to lead the conversation first. I'm going to give you a prompt, but then I'd love to hear other sources for you of, of that. But the prompt I'm going to give you is Schiller. I, I don't want to, I don't want to, I want to make sure we talk about Schiller and some of the amazing people involved in Schiller yeah. before this is all wrapped. Yeah, absolutely. So that's, that's my prompt. I'm not even going to guide you anywhere down the oh, Schiller just, road. Why don't you start, Schiller. why don't you start by telling, uh, I keep saying the word Schiller, but why don't you start by telling people who may not know what Schiller is and a few of those people involved and then uh, anything else you'd want to say about it? Yeah, Schiller, man, I, I I love my crew over there. Um, a great group of guys doing great things. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess you know, uh, you know, we're like a growth agency. We work in a variety of different ways. Um, we consult with a lot of uh, great people and people that we're proud to have worked with. Um, like you mentioned, Jordan Lyle earlier. We we shout out Jordan. Um, and uh, yeah, well, I guess it's been two, like two years almost now that I've been um, working with these guys and and um, holding down a lot of the more creative things. It started, uh, yeah, two years ago uh, for NFT NYC. Um, Fungible had picked up a piece of mine from uh, my last Frontier collection, and, and we had some really great conversations and. Um, we're keeping in touch and I saw that he was, uh, in need of, uh, of some sort of, I was like, what are you guys doing? And he's like, we're gonna display a bunch of artists work in New York city. And like, we, we need to make a video so that we can like put it on these vans. And I was like, oh, that's cool. Like I could definitely do that. And, um, so we like produced this video together and anyways, long story short, now it's been a couple of years and we've done all sorts of activations and crazy cool stuff and supported artists. And yeah, I uh, shout out TP shout out Rugama, Bernardo, Fungible, uh, Buna, uh, the whole squad. Um, yeah, I, I love working with those guys. It's a constant positive environment and, um, we, we love working with also, we, I just think that, I never would have imagined working with the variety of people that we've worked with um, if it wasn't for Schiller. And I've met so many just like great minds and great projects and people that are just like, wow, these people are really smart, man. Like we're working with some really smart people, really cool people. They're on the cutting edge of technology. And um, yeah, th that's like my, I would, that's like my web three fam. That's like my family of web three is the Schiller team. Like, I talk to them every day. We take care of each other. We check in on each other. Um, we look into the future together and and um, we hold down uh, our, uh, you know, everybody holds down their aspects of, of what they do for the company and, and what we do, you know, ultimately all for each other. So, uh, yeah, yeah, we, we uh, a better description, I guess, of Schiller is... Um, you know, we work with a variety of different clients in a variety of different ways. And, and we always try to keep that organic and we always try to do it in, in a way that we think is right and makes sense and benefits 
of people, none of that weird stuff. We don't do none of the weird, <laughs> the weird things. We're not doing gimmicks. We're not doing uh, shills um, and all that kind of stuff. Which is ironic. Uh, and, uh, which is ironic. Which is yeah, yeah. That's the <laughs> we're we're changing the narrative. We're trying to change the narrative of what a shell should be, um, and uh, yeah, and of course, uh, Buna holds it down uh, with his podcast, and uh, we have that aspect of Schiller as well as uh, really tuning in to individuals in the space and what they're doing. And you know, you've listened to Buna before; he's uh, fantastic on the mic. Um, and then our spaces too, cultivating that community and things like that and talking about important topics, talking about um, what artists can do to, um, you know, create better marketing, um, having just vibe sessions on spaces, bringing in uh, artists and asking them why art, what does art mean, um, those fantastic questions like that. And uh, as well as even... Uh, you know, our generated space that we do every week as well and, and touching on on those people that are, are creating in that medium. So that's a random, sporadic description of Schiller and the people and what we do. Beautiful. I love it. What or who else inspires you outside of Schiller? Um, A lot of people. A lot of people inspire me. I am one of those people that just I feed off of others. For sure. That's my personality type. I think um, it doesn't even like batter the medium. It doesn't even I'm just inspired by people in general. I think um, even if people are like mean or like uh, sort of come off like negatively, I think that can be um, pretty inspiring. It's tr it's hard to just like throw a couple things out there because I think it's a really um it's just sort of like a human conscious thing, like a, as a whole, humans as a whole, I think are, uh, I don't know, nature, I guess, in general, in that and that includes humans, I think, is mostly what's inspiring to me and um, how the mind works and, and how we perceive things and uh, changing perception and all, all that stuff, I think, is, is really cool. And, uh, you know, making the most of your short life on Earth is also cool. So, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to segue the who inspires you question into who do you want to suggest? Now, just like Justin Wetch did for Conor Grasso. Yeah. Who should be on the future of art? That is a great question. And Justin took some time before he said my name. So I have to think for a second. <laughs> <laughs> Um, if I had to recommend, I only get one recommendation. That's it. I'd Just one. To... I always say, so, I always say not to be, so hard. not to the exclusion of anyone. Like we know that, you know, of yeah. course, in all of our minds, there are five, 10, 20 people kicking around, but in this yeah. moment, in this moment, totally. this stroke of creative inspiration, who who's top of mind? Um, wow, this is way hard. Um, I'd say some of the people that inspire me the most right now, specifically in, in, you know, and I want to go to, I want to go to photography, mm -hmm. um, and, and keep the photographer thing on the roll. Um, I'd say, uh, I'd say, uh, Joey, Joey Miller, um, I think is, uh, really fantastic and an interesting person and artist. And I would, I would probably recommend him. Fantastic. I thought you were going to say Joey L. I'm like, Connor, he was just on. It was <laughs> Put him back on the podcast. Get him back. Get him back. Uh, no, that's no, great. Yeah. I, I would I would recommend Joey, but there's so many other people too that that um, come to mind, and it's like it's hard to pick one because I could write you a list of twenty. Um, but yeah, I think Joey's an incredible artist, and I would love to hear from him. Amazing, 
talk people through where they should look. If they've enjoyed this conversation, they've enjoyed you talking about your own creative inspirations, your own work, your solo show, some of the things you've done in Web3 and beyond, point them wherever you want to now, whether it's your website, which I actually quite enjoyed. I enjoy the layout of your website and how it guides you Thank through, you. Like it, it just guides you through the different bodies of work um, that you have. But where would you send people? Um, I would send people to my website. I think um, that the website is becoming a lost art almost. Uh, I think, uh, you know, it's a lot of just, just go to my Twitter, go to my Instagram. And it's not a very uh, long form experience, really. Uh, and, and I'd much rather people go check out my website. It's Connor.io, C-N-N-N, that's three N's, R.io, Connor.io. You can find the, the link to my website uh, in my socials as well, um, which is also uh, some sort of uh, variation of a C and three N's and an R. Um, or you can just look up Connor Grasso um, and you'll probably find me. Um, but yeah, check out my website and, um, yeah, that's go, go, go look at it. Just go look at the photos and don't even just go into it and just look at them. That's all. <laughs> Agre- go through that scroll. I highly recommend it. I'm so glad you, by the way, you broke it down. I had the CNNR.io, bro. I was ready. I was ready to lob that at you, but yeah, I, w- I would, I would double down on that. Like I said, I, I, I've really enjoyed since Justin recommended having this conversation being able to spend the time. It's always my favorite part. Well, beyond talking to you, but beyond, behind the scenes, going down the rabbit hole of a person who's been recommended by another person I trust. It's a really, really special experience. And when, when someone has a website like yours, it makes it a lot, a lot better of an experience. So please, please go do that. Yeah. And, and thank you. Cause my website has uh, changed. I'm like a constant trying to make things better and, I probably had like 30 websites in the past, like two years, like 30 different designs. And I'm really happy with that one. So yeah, I'm happy that it's working in the way that I want it to. <laughs> now, or do you, do you, uh, total side note question, do you take care of the website design or do you get in the weeds on that and, and iterate it and oh, make yeah. it the way you want? Oh yeah. I guess um, an, another thing, um, just a more of a blanket statement is that I also, um, outside of photography, do uh, like web design, build websites. I've been doing that for a while. Um, 3D, which I've gotten into in the last three years, um, I do quite a bit of, and I'm working on a big project right now uh, with Schiller. Oh, um, in uh, doing some 3D things, and um, yeah, also just like video editing, I've directed music videos and stuff like that down in LA and uh, graphic design, all sorts of stuff. Um, but photography is my baby. So um, yeah, I handle a lot of things outside of uh, outside of the camera and uh, it does keep me going in the photography space themselves. So um, that's constantly inspiring. It's the casual mic drop at the end that you are, in fact, a renaissance man. You know, just just <laughs> lay, lay that track down and keep it moving. Love it. Well, Connor, it, it's it's been a pleasure. Thanks for having the conversation, spending the time. Excited to do it on Spaces as well, of course. And then I imagine, ideally, in the future, this lineage of the future of art that now is starting to spawn the conversations recommended by the original conversation. Yeah. I, I love it. And I hope we're going to have many more chances to interact, man. Yeah, thanks so much, Roger. This was a fantastic uh, interview and experience. Thank you for listening and for being part of the future of art. If you liked the episode, please rate, review, and subscribe on your favorite platform and onward to the many conversations that await us. The Future of Art is produced by Artifacts. Artifacts, A-R-T-I-F-E-X, was created to honor today's top digital fine artists in three dimensions. Each artist's one of one work of art becomes a collectible 3D sculpture and centerpiece of an immersive world built in Unreal Engine, the creation tool of Epic Games. Search Artifacts Viewer on Apple and download our brand new free app to experience the sculptures in augmented reality and visit artifacts.art slash unreal to literally step inside the art on your browser.